Uh, I'm very, very grateful to have the opportunity of, of speaking to you today. Um, uh, I, I did have a couple of hours sleep. It's one o'clock here uh, in, in the morning, uh, but I wanted to be with you. Um, uh, and this is a topic that uh, will keep me awake. I'm excited about it. So, so don't worry about me falling asleep. Um, I'm very happy to be able to be involved in uh, any way in teaching more about uh, the history of the church uh, and the teachings of the church. Uh, and this is a very interesting period, although we're only going to be able to cover it uh, briefly. I, I feel I have the beginnings of, of um, maybe a book if the Lord spares me long enough. Uh, there's so much that could be written, uh, but, but I promise I've not tried to fit it all into this uh, lecture. Uh, nor have I tried to have hundreds and hundreds of dates. Um, if you're making notes, there's stuff that's worth making notes about, but I've tried to make not make it just a long list of, of names and dates, uh, but we have to have names and dates in there at some point. Uh, let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, as we take time to study and investigate uh, the work of your Holy Spirit in the life of the church uh, in every century and especially now this evening in the sixth century, uh, we see that you have been working at all times and in all circumstances uh, to bring about the salvation of men and women. And we will see as we gather together that there is always human weakness that prevents the fullness of all that you desire for us. But thank you, as we study the past, we can learn for our present and our future. And we pray that as we gather together in this way for this short time, you will grant us peace in our hearts and our homes, that we might be able to commit ourselves to this study uh, and find in it material which is useful for us and fruitful in our lives and in our service. Be present with us now, we pray, uh, and with all those intending to join in a moment, and hear us as we lift our voices to you, our Heavenly Father, and pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil through Jesus Christ our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, I was asked at the very beginning when I received an invitation to participate to pitch this at uh, university level. Um, I don't know what that means in Canadian terms, so I'm gonna go with what I think is fairly universally university, le universally university level. Uh, it's gonna require some thought, it's gonna require some attention, but it's, it's not just sort of uh, youth Sunday school material. Um, ho hopefully we'll find this an interesting study. Uh, I hope so, because I'm doing the one in two weeks, and I'd like to see at least some of you come, come back for that one. Uh, so, so let's begin. Uh, we have neglected the study of our Coptic Orthodox Church during the centuries after the Council of Chalcedon. Most of us have remembered just a few references here and there, especially whatever we find in the Synaxarium. But the Synaxarium itself is a historical text, and it requires study. It's a text that is concerned with historical matters, but is also limited by the historical knowledge of those who compiled it in the medieval times. It's sometimes historically inaccurate, and I notice this as I'm, I'm reading out the Synaxarium in the liturgy. Uh, even while we appreciate that it serves especially a hagiographical purpose to inspire us, the, the lack of a detailed understanding of our church history leads to a misrepresentation of especially this controversial period we're looking at over the next couple of, of sessions. It, it impoverishes our understanding of our faith and it limits our description of people and events to stereotypes. But the history of the church is never so simple. The complexities that a proper study uncovers uh, provide, I believe, necessary insights as we continue to engage theologically and ecumenically with other Christians. Such conversations must take place today based on what actually happened in the past. Church history matters, it seems to me, because we only discover ourselves more completely in the present as we seek to uncover what really took place in our own past. <clears throat> 
Uh, in this presentation, uh, we will consider some of the most important aspects of the sixth century from especially the perspective of Coptic Orthodox Church history. This means that we will tend to focus on the history of the church as it affected and was affected by the Orthodox Church of Alexandria. And we will consider both the events which occurred in Egypt in this period and those important events and people outside of Egypt, which had a significant effect on our church. So the Church of Rome will only feature tangentially in our presentation this evening, and the church in Persia also only tangentially. Uh, most of the material we're looking at is, is dealing with uh, events in Alexandria, in Antioch, Syria, uh, and in Constantinople. Um, and how these three areas and the three leaders uh, and churches involved affected one another. So we begin, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll tell you I have 12 slides um, and I'm going to limit my talk to an hour or so. So uh, that's about how long we're going to go on. Uh, we have to begin a little before the turn of the century if we want to understand the circumstances that were experienced in the first years of the sixth century. In AD 500, the church was in the middle of a schism between the East and the West that had begun in AD 484, and it would continue until AD 519. The schism originated as a result of the religious policy of Emperor Zeno, who reigned from AD 474 to AD 491. Uh, there's a few dates, there aren't so many more. Zeno belongs outside of the period of our presentation, but the effects of his reign and policies were to last well into the sixth century. It's impossible for us not to say a little bit about it. He was a soldier and a political figure who had risen to such importance in the time of the Emperor Leo that he had married the princess. He only had a daughter. And his own son, the grandson of the Emperor Leo, was heir apparent to the imperial throne. Zeno was from the region of Isauria in Asia Minor. Uh, it's a mountainous region where the population were independently minded and often in rebellion. Leo had hoped that having some of these strong mountain men in his entourage at Constantinople would counter the influence of the Germanic soldiers and political figures who had been gaining importance in previous decades. Now, Zeno had known the non-Chalcedonian Peter the Fuller. Uh, he had become Patriarch of Antioch in AD 470. He had been challenged and he was exiled on several occasions afterwards. But Zeno had spent two years in Antioch where he became familiar with the non-Chalcedonian views. When he became emperor, he was not popular with the people of Constantinople since he was hardly of noble origin and he had only become emperor through his marriage to Ariadne, the princess, and his being the father of young Leo II. The Isaurians were considered outsiders and unsophisticated, and the imperial treasury had been left empty by Leo I, so it was not even possible for Zeno to win over the population by gifts and generosity. The most important aspect, though, of Zeno's reign as far as it relates to our subject of church history in the sixth century, is that he worked to bring about a reconciliation between those who supported Chalcedon and those who rejected it. There were not two churches at this time. The idea that in AD 451, just after the Council of Chalcedon, the church divided into two entirely separated communities is false. In fact, until late into the sixth century, as we will see, there was only one church, but it was certainly divided among itself, so that in different places and at different times, the attitude towards Chalcedon could be seen to swing this way and then that way. A bishop in one place might be considered to be unacceptable or unworthy or even a teacher of error to some extent. But he was not a bishop in a different church. There was still only the imperial church. And the emperors continued to be interested in its unity for the sake of the well being of the empire. Uh, we can pass over many of these details since they are outside our concern. But we should notice this. When the non Chalcedonian Peter Mongus was Patriarch of Alexandria 
he had been expelled by Zeno, who replaced him with a moderate Chalcedonian, Timothy Salafakionis, Timothy Wobblehat. Uh, I think it was because he had a certain uh, inconsistency in his, in his beliefs and principles. There was a great deal of confusion in Alexandria and Egypt because of this. There weren't two churches uh, in, in Alexandria. And some of the monks from Alexandria went to Constantinople uh, and went before the court and the emperor and pleaded the cause of Peter Mongus. And in response, the emperor Zeno issued this document, this very important document, the Hanotico. And it was a text which was intended, first of all, to bring unity to Egypt before it was considered as a general document that could be used throughout the empire. And its purpose was to establish a basis for the reconciliation of the two parties. Uh, now we'll, we'll uh, have readings from some of the important historians of this period. Uh, and one of the first historians that we're going to read a little bit from just now is Zachariah of Mytilene and his history uh, uh, is available in English translation and it's available uh, online as well. Now Peter, that's Peter Mongus, having considered the contents of this document, found that its provisions were framed faithfully and with all righteousness, but he hesitated somewhat because there was no clear and express anathema of the synod of the Council of Chalcedon and the tome, the tome of Leo in it. And consequently, he feared it might prove a stumbling block to the people. However, he decided to accept it, inasmuch as it proclaimed the definition of the faith laid down by the 318, and it confessed the truth of the 150 bishops. And it also agreed to the 12 anathemas of Cyril, and it anathematized Nestorius and Eutyches, and it also confessed that the body of Christ derived from the virgin was of the same nature as our body. Accordingly, he subscribed to it. And he also promised that if the others, that's especially the supporters of Proterius from the time of Chalcedon, if the others would repent and also accept all the provisions of the Henoticon and persuade the people to that effect, he would receive them into communion with himself, whatever their orders, whatever their rank in the church. Now, this was certainly the strength and the weakness of the Henoticon. It expressed an orthodox understanding of Christ, which most people on both sides could accept. But it failed to deal with the issue of the Council of Chalcedon one way or the other. Now, at this time, Peter Mongus was restored to his position. Uh, but as is the way throughout church history, one of the Chalcedonians in Alexandria, a certain man called John Talea, uh, one of the priests of Alexandria had bribed the prefect or governor of Alexandria to have him consecrated bishop. Uh, he didn't get very far and he was forced to flee the city in his own turn. And he set off for Rome where he presented himself as a victim of Peter Mongus and those with him. Uh, now, Pope Simplicius was uh, the Pope at this time and he and the Roman popes after him supported John Talea uh, and said that he was the rightful patriarch of, An of Alexandria. Uh, and then they went further and they excommunicated Acacius, the patriarch of Constantinople, who had entered into communion with Peter Mongus on the basis of the Henoticon. Uh, and so this was the cause of the Acacian schism. The Henoticon was opposed in the east by Calandion of Antioch, but he was implicated in a rebellion against the Emperor Zeno. This seemed to happen a lot. Uh, senior bishops would be implicated in a rebellion in one way or another, uh, some sort of political dispute against the, em the Emperor, and this often led to them being replaced. And he was replaced by the non-Chalcedonian Peter the Fuller, uh, who we spoke of a little earlier. He had been patriarch several times, and he came back and then he would be expelled. And then he came back and he would be expelled. Uh, but now he came back in 484 uh, as this Acacian schism was starting. Uh, and so this is why I mention it. In the years just before the beginning of the sixth century, there was a non-Chalcedonian patriarch in Alexandria, Peter Mongus. And there was a non-Chalcedonian patriarch in Antioch, Peter the Fuller. 
And there was at least a very sympathetic patriarch in Constantinople, Acacius. And in Egypt, there was a general unity of the population under the terms of the Henoticon, so that even the small party of Chalcedonians agreed to enter into communion with Peter Mongus. Uh, it was not the case at this time that there were two absolutely irreconcilable parties in the church who were essentially two different churches. Uh, and then as I have as the last point on this particular slide, it was in Rome, it was in Rome that this reconciliation was forcefully rejected. And it was especially rejected because Rome felt that whatever had taken place in Chalcedon was the will of the Roman Pope and it could never be changed or undermined or subverted because it would damage and harm and diminish the primacy of the Pope of Rome. Uh, and so in AD 500, the Acacian Schism was still in progress and uh, the Pope who succeeded Simpi Simplicius, Pope Felix, in his own turn, he had deposed and excommunicated Acacius. And for his part, Acacius had taken the name of Felix from the diptychs or the list of those bishops commemorated in the liturgy. Uh, and so it, it, was, it, it was in this state of the church where there was unity to a great extent in the East and where there were non-called Chalcedonian patriarchs uh, in three of the major seeds. It was at this point that uh, the sixth century began. In AD 500, at the beginning of our period, John I was patriarch in Alexandria. Now, we read that he was the first Alexandrian monk to be consecrated a patriarch, rather than one of the clergy from the city. And he had been a monk of the monastery of St. Macarius the Great. Uh, he received into his communion all those who accepted the Christology of the Henoticon, even if they weren't able to formally anathematize the Council of Chalcedon. And so in this way, he was able to preserve unity in the Church of Alexandria. Uh, he focused more on what people themselves believed uh, rather than what they believed about what was becoming a historical event. The emperor was now Anastasius, and he had succeeded Zeno in AD 491, and he was a popular choice, as Zeno was an unpopular one. When Zeno had died, the population of Constantinople had gathered in the, in the arenas uh, to insist that someone who was a Roman should become the emperor. Uh, the Emperor Zeno did have a brother, but he was also an Isaurian, uh, and this was not a, a popular choice at all. And so the widowed Empress, uh, the wife of Zeno, the princess of the previous Emperor Leo, he, she married a successful imperial administrator. She married uh, essentially a civil servant, and she made him Emperor. Uh, Anastasius had definite sympathies with the non-Chalcedonians. And the period of influence and unity, which had begun with the Henoticon uh, in AD 484, continued under him. Yet the issue of Chalcedon always remained as a stumbling block. And we read, during these times, accordingly, the Synod of Chalcedon was neither openly proclaimed in the most holy churches, nor yet was it repudiated by all. But the bishops acted each according to his individual opinion. Uh, Euphemius, patriarch in Constantinople, uh, had, had succeeded uh, Acacius, who was friendly to the non-Chalcedonians, and he broke off communion with Peter Mongus in Alexandria, because Peter Mongus had condemned Chalcedon. Uh, the Emperor Anastasius replaced him because he didn't want a bishop, ta a bishop taking such a stance, but the replacement Macedonius also refused to condemn Chalcedon, and he was eventually forced out of Constantinople in, in 511. Uh, meanwhile, in Antioch now, there was another patriarch, Flavian II, and he also refused to condemn Chalcedon, just as did Elias in Jerusalem. So the Emperor Anastasius found himself dealing with uh, perhaps a more complicated situation. Most of these bishops could agree with the Henoticon. Most of them had uh, a similar enough Christology. But the issue of Chalcedon itself was always present to undermine the unity which might have been possible. This period expresses something of the confused context of these centuries. Most people agreed about Christology, 
whether they spoke of one nature or two. But the issue of Chalcedon had not been resolved, and it meant different things to the different parties in this controversy. The Roman church could not see the importance of Chalcedon diminished because its own precedence was tied up with the council and the tome of Leo and their understanding of the primacy of the church and the popes of Rome. Those in the Eastern church who supported Chalcedon could not see it rejected because they believed that it expressed the integrity of the humanity and the divinity of Christ. While those in the Eastern church who rejected Chalcedon, the non-Chalcedonians, did so because they believed that it failed to express the unity of the humanity and divinity in Christ. Most were able to accept the Henoticon as describing the Lord Jesus Christ in a proper and orthodox manner, but there were these different understandings of what Chalcedon represented, though everyone was sure that their understanding was the only one and the correct one, and this led to division. Another important historian of this period is John of Ephesus, and again, his uh, history of the church of this period is translated into English and is available online. In his history, he writes this. Some very strictly maintained what had been put forward by that synod and would not yield to the extent of one word of its determinations, nor admit even the change of a single letter. But they firmly declined all contact and communion with those who refused to admit the matters set forth there. Others again, who did not only not submit to the Synod of Chalcedon and its determinations, but even anathematized it and the Tome of Leo. Others still, however, firmly adhered to the Henoticon of Zeno, and that too, although mutually at variance on the point of the single and the double nature, influenced by an inclination for peace. Thus the churches in general were divided into distinct factions and their presidents did not even admit each other to commune. The emperor Anastasius was concerned that there be unity in the empire and the Henoticon had provided some basis for this unity, but the issue of Chalcedon remained and produced division. When the Henoticon had first been published, it had been accepted as a means of unity even by those who disagreed. However, in these first years of the sixth century, there was frustration that Chalcedon had not been addressed one way or the other. And so we read that many began to separate from those who accepted the Henoticon. Uh, this is what is written in the histories. They took this course because there was no clear and decided anathema of the Synod and the Tome, either in the Henoticon or in the letters of the chief priests to Peter, that's Peter Mongus in Alexandria. And gradually the number of these separatists was increased and they received a considerable accession to their numbers in the monasteries. Now, in these years, Severus of Antioch, of whom we will speak uh, more in a few slides, before his episcopate was one of those who rejected the Henoticon because it failed to deal with Chalcedon. Uh, later on, he expressed his views about the Henoticon saying this, while the things wickedly done at Chalcedon against the Orthodox faith are not anathematized by name, no argument can persuade me, like an interpreter of dreams, to expound and forcibly understand the text of the Edict, of the Henoticon, as a rejection of these things. For it contains a right confession of faith only, though by itself it is destitute of healing what is required. Uh, and so here, St. Severus, uh, he expresses a view that he could accept the Christology of the Henoticon. It was correct and orthodox, but in failing to deal with Chalcedon, he felt that there was this, uh, this problem uh, existing in the church, which prevented uh, reconciliation and prevented the healing of the division in the church. We will see that this remained a stumbling block through the sixth and seventh centuries even when it was clear that both sides still held essentially the same faith in Christ. Uh, and in this statement by Severus of Antioch, we see that it was not the Henoticon itself, which was at fault in its theological and Christological expressions. 
but it was because the problem which both sides felt there was, uh, was simply being swept under the carpet uh, and no one quite knew how to deal with it. Severus of Antioch is one of the most important figures of the sixth century. Uh, in the Coptic Orthodox tradition, he is considered one of the greatest of the theologians. Uh, in the absolution at the beginning of the liturgy, Severus is named before every other father of the church, and only after St. John the Baptist, St. Stephen the First Martyr, and St. Mark the Evangelist. We have lost a sense of how important he was in our church in earlier centuries. Uh, and there are many members of our church that I speak to who have no real idea uh, of who St. Severus is or was and what he taught. He was considered one of three with St. Athanasius and St. Cyril, and even the greatest of them, because he summed up in his own ministry all that they had taught in theirs. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole history of, of Severus of Antioch. Uh, I have spoken about him in other videos on, on my own website. But he was born in about AD 465 in Asia Minor, in modern Turkey. Uh, the Synaxarium follows a later and rather apologetic tradition, which says that he was the grandson of another Bishop Severus who had prophesied about his descendant. Um, but Severus himself in his sermons tells us that he was born a pagan. Uh, and he was set free from the worship of idols when he was converted under the influence of Christian friends. He trained as a lawyer and spent part of his time in Egypt. And after he graduated and when he had been baptized, he abandoned all thoughts of a career in the world and entered a monastery in Palestine. Now this monastery was part of the non-Chalcedonian tradition and it had been established by Peter the Iberian, uh, a prince from that area that is now known as Georgia. In time, he had received his inheritance, that's Severus, and he established a small monastery of his own. And in AD 500, he was ordained a priest. About AD 507, a strict Chalcedonian called Nephalius came to Palestine during the confused period described in the first decade. And he started preaching publicly against those who rejected Chalcedon, and he caused some problems, uh, which led to the expulsion of some monks. And so Severus went up to Constantinople to defend the non-Chalcedonian community before the Emperor Anastasius. Uh, throughout this period, the Acacian Schism was still active with Rome in the West, and the Emperor Anastasius was still trying to explore any means of reconciliation in the divided church. Severus was becoming well known as a theologian and a defender of the non-Chalcedonians, and when the opportunity presented itself, he was elected as Patriarch of Antioch in AD 512. The previous Patriarch Flavian had been a supporter of Chalcedon, and the first thing that Severus did when he arrived in Antioch to great crowds of supporters was to condemn Chalcedon and the Tome of Leo, but also to approve the Henotico. Severus is present throughout this second decade. Once again, it seemed that everything might change for the good. Timothy I of Constantinople was now patriarch there, and he was in communion with Severus, as was John of Alexandria. Rome was out of the picture because of the Acacian Schism, and only Jerusalem was violently opposed to the non-Chalcedonians. We are fortunate that we have a great many of the writings of Severus still available to us although it's only recently that members of our Coptic Orthodox Church have seriously begun to study his teachings again. He wrote more than 3,000 letters to various correspondents, monks, nuns, lay people, bishops and priests, and we're fortunate that more than 300 of them have been preserved and are available in English translation. Uh, he wrote a number of important theological texts in defense of the non-Chalcedonian position, and towards the end of his life, against the heresy of Julianism, which taught that Christ had not truly suffered or died because from the moment of the incarnation, he was already completely glorified and unable to suffer or die. When he was Patriarch of Antioch, he preached very often and more than 125 of his sermons have been preserved. These are in French translation uh, or Syriac, if you have Syriac as a language, 
Uh, I, I've been translating some of them into English, uh, probably not very well, but uh, uh, they're, they're a pleasure to read and study. Um, even as he was preaching the sermons, even as he was preaching the sermons, there were stenographers writing them down. Uh, and even in his lifetime, they were being translated from the Greek in which he preached into the Syriac language of the surrounding countryside. So even in his life, he was recognized as being uh, a very significant figure, uh, a wonderful preacher, uh, almost comparable, certainly within our own tradition, to St. John Chrysostom. Uh, he wrote a hundred hymns or more, uh, and these are available in English translation as well. Uh, and his hymns in Syriac are still sung by uh, the Syriac Orthodox Church. He was one of the last great masters of so many different aspects of learning and spiritual culture. Uh, but his time in uh, Antioch was, was limited. Uh, it was often the death of an emperor that brought about significant changes in the church. This had happened, if you remember, in AD 449, when the emperor Theodosius had fallen from his horse and died and was replaced by Marcion, who called the Council of Chalcedon and brought about the division of the church. And now in AD 518, it was Anastasius who died, and he was replaced by Justin, who took a different view of the problems in the church and the empire. Justin was an older man, and he'd risen from very humble beginnings through service in the military to become the emperor. He had a limited knowledge of Greek, being a Latin speaker, and so he was naturally interested in restoring unity with the Roman church. Emperor Anastasius had been involved in negotiations with Rome, but had refused to submit to their demands. But Justin accepted them all, and the Acacian schism was resolved. These demands included that the name of the condemned patriarch Acacius, as well as the names of the Emperor Anastasius and Zeno, were stricken from the church diptychs. They were removed from all commemoration in the church. Uh, it was also required that Patriarch John II of Constantinople accepted the formula of faith, which Pope Hormizdas sent over. Uh, and the Pope of Rome had made even more extreme demands in previous dialogues and conversations, and he had insisted that there be a complete submission to himself as the head of all the church before any conversation could take place. Justin made a formal acceptance of Chalcedon a necessary and legal condition in the empire. We start to see that emperors uh, make religious things into law so that you have to accept certain religious positions to be able to function as a citizen in the empire. And he began to remove those bishops who would not comply with his demands. And so he ordered that Severus be detained with the intention it seems of putting him on trial and even cutting out his tongue. Um, but Severus escaped over the mountains from Antioch to the port of Seleucia Pieria on the coast, and he took a boat to Alexandria and exiled. And more than 50 of his bishops were also exiled, and many of them also followed him to relative safety in Egypt. It was only a, a relative safety. The majority status of the non-Chalcedonian community in Egypt made it impossible for the imperial authorities to exercise their will in quite the way they did in other places. Uh, we read a, 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 a paragraph now from the history of the patriarchs of Alexandria. Uh, and this is a, a text which was compiled uh, eventually in the medieval period. Uh, and it describes uh, with varying degrees of, of detail and varying degrees of accuracy, uh, the period of each patriarch in our church history, beginning with St. Mark. Uh, again, it's available in English translation and online. And we read this. In those days, Timothy was at Alexandria. And when Severus, the patriarch, and his bishops who were from the east were driven away from Antioch and came to Egypt, those bishops came to the city of Alexandria. And many nuns who were virgins were driven out of the monasteries and the father Severus, at this time of trouble, was fleeing from city to city, secretly or openly, and from monastery to monastery. And he wrote to the bishops, his companions who were Alexandria, and he consoled them and encouraged them to have patience. And he charged them to endure the persecutions uh, with fortitude. 
Uh, again, it's important to know that in the history of the patriarchs, uh, St. Severus features more, there's more written about Severus than about many of the patriarchs of Alexandria themselves. He's a significant figure in our church history and tradition, though he's become forgotten. It was in this period of exile that the account of the patriarch Severus in one of the Egyptian monasteries is found as we read in the Synaxarium. And so this is probably uh, familiar to many of you, though perhaps you hadn't really noticed that it was about Severus. Uh, it's about Severus, the patriarch of Antioch during his exile. And we read this. One day, St. Severus went to the desert of Skeet at Wadi El Natrun, and he entered the church in the clothing of a foreign monk. And a great miracle took place at that time. It came to pass that after the priests had placed the Orban on the altar and gone around the church offering the incense, uh, and after the reading of the epistles and the gospel, uh, he lifted off the prosperine and he could not find the Orban on the pattern. And so the priest was disturbed and wept. And he turned towards the worshippers saying, oh, my brethren, I cannot find the Orban on the pattern. And I don't know whether this thing has happened because of my sin or because of your sin. And the people wept. And immediately the angel of the Lord appeared to the priest and told him, this has not happened because of your sin or because of the sin of the worshippers but because you have offered the Orban in the presence of the patriarch. And the priest replied, where is he, O my Lord? And the angel pointed towards St. Severus, and he was standing in a corner of the church. And the priest recognized him by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And the priest came to St. Severus, who commanded him to continue the liturgy after they brought him to the altar with great honor. And when the priest had gone back up to the altar, he found the offering on the pattern as before, and they all praised God and glorified his holy name. Uh, th this period shows us how close the church was, and it was not restricted to any sort of ethnic composition. Many of the people were still Greek, and the Greek patriarch of Antioch in Syria was not only made welcome in Egypt, but more highly respected than anyone else. There are few saints in our Synaxarium. I couldn't really find any. Perhaps there are one or two. There are few saints in our Synaxarium who have three feasts. Uh, I could only think of St. Mark and the commemorations associated with him. But for St. Severus, we keep the anniversary of his coming into Egypt, the anniversary of his death, and then the anniversary of the burial of his body in his shrine. Our own history of the patriarchs of Alexandria has more to say about him uh, than many of the less well-known patriarchs. And in the end, the account concludes saying, he remained in the midst of struggles and enduring persecution from the heretics for 30 years upon the throne of Antioch and amidst opposition and distress for six years. And he did not cease from this life of fighting for the Orthodox faith until death. So when he had accomplished his course, still preserving the true faith, he went to the Lord Christ whom he loved and received the crown of victory with the Holy Fathers in the assembly of the heavenly virgins. Uh, what, what wonderful words. Severus remained in Egypt from AD 519 when he was expelled from Antioch to his death in AD 538. He was in communion and close partnership with several of the patriarchs of Alexandria in this period who looked to him as the elder statesman of non-Chalcedonianism. Uh, when Severus had first become patriarch of Antioch, it was John II who was in Alexandria. And we read this. Severus wrote a synodical letter to the father John the patriarch concerning the unity of the faith, wherein he announced the agreement between them in the one orthodox creed of the Holy Father. St. John the Patriarch and his bishops accepted this letter and read it in their churches throughout the land of Egypt, and they offered prayers and thanked the Lord Christ, who had restored the divided members to their places. And with great joy and spiritual exaltation did John the Holy Patriarch write to the great Severus an answer to his letter in canonical language, full of the Orthodox faith, which is that of the teachers of the church, as the blessed Severus had written to him. And when the envoys of Severus returned to him with this gift, which was a fitting reward for his friendship, he rejoiced and was exceedingly glad. 
And then in the time of Dioscorus II, who succeeded him, we read this. When the father John the Patriarch went to his rest, he had a scribe whose name was Dioscorus and who was a man perfect in all his relations, humble and good. And there was none like him in his time. And so they ordained him Patriarch upon the evangelical throne. Then he wrote a synodical letter to the father Severus in which he informed him of the death of the blessed father John and announced that he had taken his seat after him upon the apostolic throne. And so Severus wrote an answer to him to console him and to confirm him in the Orthodox faith and to charge him to teach the people and not to cease teaching and to encourage him in this work. This very positive relationship between the leadership of the church in Alexandria uh, and in Antioch took place before the time of Severus's exile. But in the time of Timothy III, Patriarch of Alexandria, from AD 517 to 535, Severus was present in Egypt, moving from place to place, keeping out of the hands of the imperial authorities and supporting the church in Antioch through an unceasing volume of correspondence. Um, during the early period of his exile, under the Emperor Justin I, there was persecution in Syria against the non-Chalcedonians, and many monks were expelled from their monasteries. We read in Zechariah of Mytilene. Now the believing cloistered monks in the East had also, moreover, been expelled and had withdrawn from the year three until the year nine, one week that is of years, from their monasteries in the district of Antioch and in Euphratesia and also in Osrahini and Mesopotamia. The historian John of Ephesus had experience of this himself. As a youth, he had joined a monastery in the East that had been expelled in AD 521 and forced to re relocate to a deserted monastery in a more remote location. The monastery of the famous St. Peter the Iberian was also assaulted. And we can see the connection between the Christians of this time when we read about an account of a certain John. This blessed man again, the great and divine John was by his birth a Syrian, that is a Palestinian from the city of Gaza. And he lived in a great monastery called that of Father Peter the Iberian, the doer of great and apostolic signs. And this monastery was expelled with the rest and came into the territory of Alexandria. And there they lived in a place called Enarton, which means the ninth mile marker. And there the saint dwelt with the rest of his monastery, living a devout life and following great and divine practices. While the church was still at peace in Alexandria, and the blessed Theodosius was seated on his throne, he heard of his manner of life and his teaching, and he sent and made him bishop in one of the cities of Egypt, which is called Hephaestu. So here is a Syrian bishop exiled to Alexandria, to Egypt, who is then made a bishop uh, of a region in Egypt itself. And this expresses the very close union there was, the sense of absolute unity between the non-Chalcedonian church in Antioch, Syria, and in Alexandria, Egypt. It was during this same period that a controversy, unfortunately, developed within the non-Chalcedonian movement in Egypt. Julian of Halicarnassus was another one of those bishops who had entered into exile in Egypt, and he was developing a Christology in which the humanity of Christ was entirely glorified and deified at the moment of the incarnation and not the moment of the resurrection. And it became clear that this meant that Christ was unable to suffer and die naturally in his humanity, and that therefore this Christology was fatally flawed. These ideas caused some division and confusion within the Church of Alexandria uh, and among those who were enduring exile there. And Severus produced several significant texts against this false Christology, and it remained a significant heresy even after he had died. Now, the Emperor Justin was a, a, an older man, uh, and towards the end of his reign, he associated his nephew with him in the government of the empire. Uh, and in AD 527, he succeeded him, him as the famous, well-known Emperor Justinian I. Now, he supported the Chalcedonian position, but he also wished to bring about unity within the empire. And so he reversed some of the policies that his uncle had employed. He allowed those monks who had been driven from their monasteries to return. 
and under the influence of his empress Theodora, uh, who was a supporter of the non-Chalcedonians, he began to make approaches to Severus uh, and to other leaders of the non-Chalcedonian community. Uh, even before the death of Justin I, we have accounts of Empress Theodora exerting her influence for the sake of the persecuted non-Chalcedonians. Mare, the elderly bishop of Amida in the east, had been driven out and was almost at the point of death uh, in a very difficult exile at Petra with three disciples who had gone with him. Uh, they thought that they would perish because they had nothing to keep them. Uh, and so one of them was sent to Constantinople to see if something could be done, if someone would uh, plead their cause. And we read about Theodora at this time. She therefore, when she learned of that distress, as if by divine instigation, because she saw that saint's distress, made her mercy manifest, and she made entreaty to Justinian, her husband, who was master of the soldiers and also a patrician and the king's nephew, asking that he would inform his uncle and that he might order relief to be given to these distressed men, making this entreaty even with tears. And through the grace which cares for every man's life, it was done and an order went out to them to come to Alexandria. So even before she became the empress, even before Justinian became emperor, she was showing a concern for the non-Chalcedonian community. Uh, and she continued to encourage and support the non-Chalcedonians uh, after the accession of Justinian. Uh, some early writers said it was simply a deliberate ploy of the royal couple uh, to support both sides and to make it seem that both sides uh, uh, had uh, some imperial influence. But those who received her help certainly considered her to be genuine uh, and worthy of every honor while she lived and after her death. Now in AD 535, the great Alexandrian patriarch Theodosius was elected. Uh, he already had a reputation as a spiritual writer, but almost immediately he was faced with opposition. Uh, and this was one of the abiding um, problems in Alexandria. Uh, the, the, the appearance of rivals to those who had been established as patriarchs, so that confusion and division uh, began to be established in the church. Uh, the archdeacon at this time was an elderly man called Guianus. And after Theodosius had been consecrated, we read in the history of the patriarchs, certain persons led the archdeacon astray and changed his thoughts in his simplicity and gave him advice saying, this promotion is due to you, and it's not lawful for anyone to be promoted before you. And thus they insinuated their evil suggestions into his mind little by little until he accepted their advice. And so this Guyanus was falsely consecrated as patriarch uh, by those who supported the heretic Julian of Halicarnassus, who was part of this group. And they caused a great deal of trouble for Theodosius. Uh, Severus continued to support him in the few years that remained of his life. Uh, but in the end, uh, Theodosius had to leave Alexandria and find refuge in Upper Egypt. Uh, and then he was invited to Constantinople by the Empress Theodora. Uh, and, and we discover, in fact, that he spent the rest of his episcopate, um, a long period of his life, uh, in exile in Constantinople, because Guyanus and those who followed him, supporters of Julian of Halicarnassus, uh, had to a great extent gained control and influence uh, in Alexandria. Uh, we'll read a little bit more about Theodosius in a moment. Now Justinian, since his accession, had been inviting Severus to come to Constantinople to enter into discussion about the faith, but he had always refused. Other bishops had engaged in these conversations, and it was clear that the substance of the faith was the same for both parties. But the issue of Chalcedon and the Tome were always a sticking point. Some of the accounts of these official conversations have been preserved, and they illustrate how there remained always a possibility for reconciliation. But it was never clear how these outstanding issues could be resolved. Uh, Severus had written to the emperor when he first refused to attend, and it was clear that he still had a very positive attitude towards the emperor. He wasn't a separatist. And he addresses the emperor in this way, saying, may the only trinity, for that is our God, preserve your orthodoxy for many years. 
keeping the dominion of the Commonwealth of the Romans in peace. And may he bring every nation of Romans and barbarians into subjection to you and grant to the holy churches by your means perfect concord in sound faith. And may he reckon you worthy to receive a crown in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so even when there was division, even when there was persecution, uh, Severus still viewed the empire and the emperor in a positive light. Uh, he didn't want to establish a separate church. He wanted to see the church of the empire uh, reformed and renewed uh, and reconciliation brought about. Uh, at last, in AD 536, two years before his repose, he accepted the promises of safe conduct from Justinian, and he went to Constantinople from Alexandria. Things were suddenly changing again, even though Justinian was certainly a Chalcedonian. Uh, and Zacharias of Mytilene describes the situation for us. Now the well-tried Severus, after receiving pressing summonses from the king, at last came to Constantinople in the year 14. And he was received in a friendly manner in the palace by the king, who was disposed and incited thereto by Theodora the queen, who was devoted to Severus, and he was honorable and venerable in her eyes. And Epiphanius, the chief priest of the city, having died, Anthemus had succeeded him. And he was an ascetic man and a practiser of poverty and a friend of the needy and a believer. A believer means a non-Chalcedonian. He was Bishop of Trebizond, and happening for some reason to be present there and being a man of virtuous character and known to the king and the magnates for his chastity, he was appointed patriarch and he would not receive the synod of Chalcedon into the faith. And Anthemus was a non-Chalcedonian and he and Severus found themselves in agreement. And at the same time, Theodosius was patriarch of Alexandria and he was also in Constantinople. Um, and so, it seemed for a moment uh, when Theodosius had communicated with Anthemus in Constantinople and Severus that there were these three patriarchs of the great churches who shared the same faith at this time. It seemed possible for a moment again that the situation in the church and the empire might change. But at the same time, Pope Agapetus of Rome arrived in Constantinople. He had come as an ambassador for King Theodahad of the Ostrogoths who ruled much of Italy hoping to prevent an invasion of the armies of Justinian. And he was shocked and horrified to find that there was a non-Chalcedonian in the patriarchal office. And he immediately deposed him, much to the anger of Justinian. But at that moment, it became more important for Justinian that there was unity with Rome, a political unity with Rome in the West, than that there be a reconciliation of the Christians in the East. And so he submitted to the demands of Pope Agapetus. Uh, Anthemus was deposed. Uh, Menas, uh, a successor, was consecrated in Constantinople. And Severus had to flee the city with the threat of torture again hanging over him. Theodosius, however, the Patriarch of Alexandria, remained in Constantinople. The Empress Theodore were Theodora was not without great influence, and she had converted the palace of Hormizdas into a refuge for the non-Chalcedonian bishops and monks. And John of Ephesus describes this community in exile, and he says that there were more than 500 men living there. He says, the congregation of persecuted saints was so widely extended that it shone with many who had, under the constraint of persecution, come down even from columns and been ejected from places of seclusion and been expelled from their districts. And the congregation was rendered illustrious by great and distinguished heads of convents from all quarters of the East and West, and Syria and Armenia, Cappadocia, Cilicia, Isauria, Lycaonia, and Asia and Alexandria and Byzantium. So from all over, there were monks and priests uh, and bishops who had found refuge uh, under the care of the Empress Theodora in Constantinople. And these men continued their monastic labors in the palace. The palace had been completely transformed into a, a huge monastery. Uh, little cells and chapels were, con were constructed here and there of timber we read and, and even blankets being hung up. And the people of Constantinople were impressed by these men. 
They were clearly not simply stubborn and prideful. And John says, many of the participators with the Synod of Chalcedon, which was a cause of scandal and of persecution of these blessed men, when they saw this marvelous community and learned the reason for its persecution, uh, they renounced the Chalcedon communion and asked for communion with them. And thus many in Constantinople were added to the number of the believers, that's non-Chalcedonians. Theodosius remained in exile in Constantinople until his death in AD 566. The Empress Theodora had passed away in AD 548, but Justinian had left the non-Chalcedonians at the palace of Hormistas unmolested in her honor. Uh, and because he was gener generally and genuinely minded to find unity uh, in the church and the empire. Uh, Menas, the new patriarch of Constantinople, um, he consecrated a, a new Chalcedonian patriarch and sent him for the first time from Constantinople to Alexandria. Uh, and the history of the patriarchs uh, of Alexandria tells us that this was the first time that the Chalcedonians had consecrated someone in, Cal in, in Constantinople and sent them to Alexandria instead of having uh, a consecration take place in Alexandria. Uh, and we are told that, that no one would have anything to do with him. Uh, they called him the new Judas. Uh, and for a year, no one would have any contact or communication with him, uh, except for the soldiers who traveled with him uh, and the governor uh, and the other political figures. But it was a difficult period for the Church of Alexandria. Uh, this, this intruding patriarch uh, representing the imperial force uh, closed all of the churches to the non-Chalcedonians. They were handed over to the small number of Chalcedonians or they were just completely closed. Um, but the Church of Alexandria, our Church of Alexandria, still considered Theodosius to be the rightful and true patriarch and remained faithful to him. Now, Justinian was deeply interested in theology and he had produced some texts on Christological issues, and he was certain of his absolute authority. And he considered that it extended even to the church. And so he enacted many laws to impose various religious beliefs. And in AD 544, he'd issued his own statement about what were called the three chapters. These were three issues that it seemed were an obstacle to reconciliation. And in his own writing, he condemned Theodore of Mopsuestia, the writings of Theodoret of Cyrus against Cyril, and the supposed letter of Ebas to Maris the Persian, uh, all of which were offensive to the non-Chalcedonians. Uh, he tried to find a way to condemn these, the, these persons and writings without undermining the Council of Chalcedon, uh, and therefore he proposed that the letter of Ebas was not actually the letter that was read at the Council of Chalcedon, so that it could be condemned without implicating Chalcedon. Uh, and then in AD 553, he called a council at Chalcedon to impose these views. Very unusually, Pope Vigilius of Rome was present, but in fact, he spent months in prison, uh, even under threat of torture and death, uh, with the emperor trying to force him to agree to what was taking place. Uh, eventually, uh, these three chapters were condemned, uh, and we agree with that. It was a positive step from our perspective, but still, the non-Chalcedonian movement was not satisfied because Chalcedon and the Tome of Leo had not been dealt with. Uh, once again, the real issues had been swept under the carpet. In Constantinople in AD 565, Justinian was just passing away. Uh, and in the very last year of his life, he adopted the heresy of Julian of Halicarnassus. Uh, and in his last days, John of Ephesus, is still generally positive. Um, much of the persecution ha has died down. Um, there were difficulties in various places. Churches were closed to some people, uh, but there wasn't quite the same violent persecution which had taken place previously. Uh, and John says this, the blessed Theodosius, patriarch of Alexandria, also had been bravely contending in the conflict of persecution for a considerable a considerable time during all the lifetime of King Justinian and he did so after his death even to the present time. Theodosius is still alive at this moment. 
which is the year 877 uh, of the Greeks, that is. A new king having also succeeded in the same year, who is Justinian's sister's son, who also promises with the help of the blessed Theodosius to bring about the peace of the church. So at this moment, John of Ephesus is, is hopeful and expectant that progress towards peace and reconciliation might continue. Uh, when Theodosius had died, uh, the Alexandrians were forbidden to replace him because uh, the Chalcedonians had sent uh, their own patriarch. But the governor of Alexandria, who was sympathetic to our church, advised them, go out to the monastery of Azajaj, as if you were going to pray there, and appoint over yourselves him whom you shall elect as patriarch. And so they thanked God and glorified the Lord Jesus Christ, and they sent to the northern cities of the land of Egypt and summoned three bishops and went out with them to the monastery of Azajaj, where they ordained a man who was a priest named Peter as patriarch. And the people received consolation through him, and their faith was strengthened, but they could not bring him into the city openly. So his residence was outside Alexandria at a distance of nine miles at the church dedicated to the name of Joseph. And they used to carry to him all that he needed, but the prince uh, knew nothing of him. He had to stay up beside the city in relative secrecy, but at least the church of Alexandria had been able to appoint a spiritual father in succession to Theodosius. And really it is from this time, uh, AD 566, that two separate and distinct hierarchies developed in Egypt and, and were never united to the present time. Uh, at this time, they, we read that there were 600 flourishing monasteries, uh, all inhabited by non-Chalcedonians. Um, uh, and this was remembered as a time of, of some prosperity in the faith, uh, even though there were difficulties. We also read that when the people of Antioch heard what the uh, Alexandrian church had done and, it, the, and that they had secretly uh, consecrated a patriarch, the Antiochians did the same. They took a man whose name was Theophanes and made him patriarch and seated him on the throne in a monastery called the Monastery of Aftonius because the heretics, the Chalcedonians, forbade the Orthodox bishops, any of them, to enter into the city of Antioch. Uh, what had been the wider situation in the years before this significant moment? There had been a period of relative peace and stability in Constantinople for the non-Chalcedonians. Uh, John had been an eyewitness to these things, and he says, for the long period then, of more than 40 years, all the congregations of the Orthodox Church in the capital and its sub suburbs enjoyed a time of peace and tranquility. Uh, much of this, most of this, was due to the influence uh, of, the, patria of the, the Empress Theodora. Um, it was also at the beginning of this time that uh, our non-Chalcedonian church began to increasingly ordain and consecrate more and more priests and bishops uh, because of persecution, because of exile, uh, especially in the East. The numbers of non-Chalcedonian bishops were much reduced, and it seemed almost that the whole church might be extinguished because of that. Uh, and so Theodora had a, a man, Jacob Baradeus, uh, consecrated as bishop essentially for the whole region of Antioch. He was to be a, a wandering traveling bishop and he traveled everywhere in disguise. And so he gained the name of Baradeus or camel blanket for the rough clothes that he wore. Uh, and he consecrated patriarchs, he consecrated bishops, hundreds and thousands of priests to provide for the continuity of the non-Chalcedonian community. Uh, the new emperor that John had spoken about was Justin II. And it was during his reign and under, his, under the influence of his patriarch, John Scholasticus, that uh, a truly severe persecution broke out in Constantinople and elsewhere. Um, John of Ephesus had been one of those who lived in the palace of Hormizdas. He'd benefited from the support of the Empress Theodora, and he had been consecrated a bishop himself by Jacob Baradeus. Uh, and he was one of those who came to experience the fierceness of this persecution uh, in a very personal manner. Uh, everything started out well, but in AD 571, everything changed. Uh, John tells us, originally, he was anxious to make unity. 
and mild and peaceable to the whole body of believers for the first six years of his reign. But then he changed and he took part in a persecution carried on in a violent and uncanonical manner. There had been other persecutions as mentioned. Generally, this involved the closure of churches and the expulsion of monks and nuns. But the cause of this new wave of persecution was the Chalcedonian Patriarch of Constantinople. Suddenly, John says, suddenly in the holy days of the Lenten fast, on the Saturday before Palm Sunday, from the urgency and wicked violence of him who governed the church in the capital, and from his numerous slanders against the whole party of the Orthodox, the non-Chalcedonians, the victorious Justin the Emperor was stirred up into a great wrath. And in an angry decree, he commanded that all the places where the believers assembled should be shut up. The altars should be destroyed, the priests and bishops seized and cast into prison, and everyone who met for worship should be driven away and dispersed and commanded never to return. And other similar decrees and injunctions were issued in great wrath, whereas up to that time they had been permitted in peace and quietness to celebrate the rites of their religion. This was both an unexpected uh, uh, persecution in regard to its sudden development and also to the ferocity with which it was applied. It was not simply a matter of placing difficulties in the way of the life of the non-Chalcedonian community. It was intended that it be eliminated entirely. And this was something new. All the churches and places of worship were to be closed, the altars destroyed, the priests and bishops put in prison. Uh, and the congregations completely dispersed and forbidden to meet together. Uh, we find an account of the treatment of one elder. He was taken before a magistrate and defended himself in the strongest terms, saying, why do you sit as a Christian and judge the servants of God as if you were a heathen? The magistrate was rather shocked, uh, and having respect for the great age of this prisoner, he ordered that he be sent before the bishop, John the Scholasticus. Perhaps he expected kinder treatment, but in fact, he was sent 90 kilometers along the coast from Constantinople, and he was imprisoned so strictly that not even his closest supporters were able to visit him. And he was held a prisoner for two years and not even allowed a change of clothing so that he soon became infested with vermin. And at the end, this elderly man became sick and died in this confinement and his body was taken by the non-Chalcedonians and brought back to the city uh, with honor. Uh, we, we read even uh, in the history uh, that soldiers came uh, with priests, Chalcedonian priests, uh, and, and they took hold of the monks and the clergy in the palace of Hormizdas, uh, and they forced them to receive communion. Even though the people were crying out saying, we cannot communicate with the Synod of Chalcedon, uh, they were dragged up to the priests and their hands were held above their heads, the history says. Uh, and with shrieks of lamentations and sobs, the sacrament, the holy sacrament, was forced into the mouth of some in spite of their screams. How, how could this happen? Uh, how could anyone imagine that this was uh, a Christian way of, of conducting uh, any sort of business? Now, some of the clergy did submit and joined themselves to the Chalcedonians. But John Scholasticus was not content with this. Uh, and after they had served with him for some time, he decided that they would all need to be reordained. Uh, and this was too much. And we read, many even of his own party blamed the step he had taken and said it was done wickedly and violently by him in violation of the church law and canonical order. There was such a scandal and such violence was committed against elderly and pious monks and even bishops that it came to the notice of the emperor. And it said that he said that nothing like this should ever be done again in the church of God. Uh, and he published immediately a royal edict forbidding everyone from ever again seeking to annul the priesthood of another, except in the case of the heresies which the ecumenical councils had decided. Uh, John Justin II had allowed John Scholasticus to do as he pleased, but when he became aware of what was being done in his name, he also issued a Christological edict in which both sides had a hand. Uh, and just as the Henoticon before it, there was no disagreement. Uh, John of Ephesus records, to this edict everyone assented, saying that it was expressed in orthodox language, 
But once again, it failed to deal with Chalcedon and the experience of prolonged and violent persecution had made the non-Chalcedonians less willing to compromise on this point of principle. It is clear that this was the main sticking point, nothing to do with Christology, since the non-Chalcedonian bishop stated, how can you expect us to come to terms with you while you still retain the synod, which has uprooted and troubled the whole church of God and proclaim it and love it? If, however, you are really anxious to bring about a unity according to your words, remove the snare and offence out of the way and eject it from the church. And so not we only, but all of the believers, all of the non-Chalcedonians, with joy and free from all cause of stumbling, we will unite ourselves to you. Uh, so there was no reason even at this time, even after severe and strict persecution, uh, it was very clear that it was the issue of Chalcedon and the tome which stood in the way of reconciliation. And if this could be moved out of the way, even despite everything the church had suffered, uh, the bishops were willing to come into communion with the Chalcedonians. Now, Alexandria was also involved in this period of persecution and confusion. Uh, many of the clergy in the palace in Constantinople were from Egypt. Um, but the educated, wealthy business merchantmen were instructed to come to Constantinople uh, from Alexandria. Uh, and they were kept there for a long time, many days, some of them for a whole year. Uh, and the, the emperor and the patriarch were trying to force them also to accept Chalcedon. Uh, and we read that finally they were let go because those in authority were afraid to proceed to acts of open violence as the capital depended upon Alexandria for its supplies of wheat. A few, a few of these men, not clergy, these were wealthy and, and leading laymen, a few of them were detained for up to three years and they all proved inflexible. They all refused uh, to submit to the demands placed on them and were set free. The Emperor Justin II slowly grew insane uh, with increasingly short periods of lucidity. Uh, and so one of his generals, Tiberius, was elevated to be co-emperor with him to take care of the day-to-day -day running of the church. Uh, and this John Scholasticus went to him, thinking maybe I'll be able to convince him to begin the persecution again. And we find this. After he had exhausted all his arguments against the believers, the Caesar replied, tell me now the truth. Who are these persons about whom you ask me and whom you urge me to persecute? Are they heathens? And the patriarch, knowing that deceit was impossible, answered, heathens, they are not. What then, he said, are they heretics? No, my lord, he replied, neither are they heretics. Well, then, said he, as you yourself bear witness, they are Christians. They are so indeed, he replied, Christians of the Christians. If then, as you bear witness, said the Caesar, that they are Christians, why do you urge me to persecute Christians as if I were a Diocletian? or one of those old heathen kings. Go and sit in your church and be quiet and do not trouble me again with such things. Uh, towards the end of his life in AD 582, the patriarch Eutychius had succeeded John Scholasticus and he also wanted to start another persecution. It's interesting that so much of this desire for persecution doesn't come from the emperor, but it comes from the patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, Tiberius answered him in the same way. We have enough to do with the wars against the barbarians, which surround us on every side. We cannot stir up another war against Christians. Go and sit quiet. If by word and admonition you can persuade them, then do so. But if not, let them alone and do not persecute them, nor trouble me, who am exposed to the attacks of war from every quarter. Uh, what then about the end of this difficult century? Uh, another schism developed. Not this time between East and West or between Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians, but within our own non-Chalcedonian movement. The churches of Antioch and Alexandria broke communion for a significant period, beginning in the time of Patriarch Peter of Alexandria, uh, who we read about being secretly consecrated in AD 567. The causes of the division are very complex and I'm not even going to uh, attempt to, des to describe them, uh, but very briefly, Theodosius had passed away. And when persecution was beginning again, an Alexandrian priest, Paul, uh, 
had been consecrated Patriarch of Antioch by Jacob Baradeus. He was not popular with the Egyptians and he had hoped that he might become Patriarch of Alexandria. During the persecution, he'd entered into communion with the Chalcedonians and then he repented of this. Uh, but Jacob Baradeus ex excommunicated him and had, and had supported a replacement um, as, as Patriarch of Antioch. At the same time in Egypt, the Bishop of Nubia had been persuaded to travel to Alexandria and consecrate an abbot, Theodore, as new Patriarch. Uh, Theodore was an older man and he, he was pressurized into accepting the consecration. Uh, and Patriarch Paul of Antioch, who was now hiding in Egypt, uh, gave support to him. And then suddenly he appeared in Alexandria as their new patriarch. And the Alexandrians knew nothing about this. Uh, and they were furious when he suddenly appeared, especially when they discovered that uh, Paul of Antioch, who they already uh, didn't think highly of, had had a part uh, in his consecration. And so another man, Peter, was consecrated in the city. Uh, and the historians tell us that there was a sense that he was easy to control and there was a party in the church that wanted a patriarch that was uh, under their thumb. And so what did we have very quickly? We had Paul in Antioch. Uh, we had his replacement in Antioch. We had Theodore in Alexandria and we had Peter in Alexandria. It became very complicated. Uh, Damien succeeded Peter in Alexandria. And he was involved in consecrating a new patriarch in Antioch, even though Paul was still alive. And so the confusion became worse rather than less. And to add to the controversy, a heresy had developed in Alexandria, which stated that each of the persons of the Holy Trinity had their own divine nature. There were three natures in the Godhead. Paul of Antioch resisted this teaching, but then he was accused of the heresy of Sibelianism, while the Alexandrians were accused of tritheism. Uh, the solution to this sad schism coming at a time when the non-Chalcedonian movement could least afford it would not take place until the seventh century. Uh, the history of the patriarchs refers to this schism without going into the details, which the later historian Bar Hebraeus provides. And it says, describing the Alexandrian perspective, Father Damien the patriarch wrote to Peter, patriarch of Antioch, but Peter, Peter, Patriarch of Antioch, was like the deaf asp, which stops its ears and will not listen to the voice of the charmer, nor to the medicine which a wise man prepares. No, he remained obstinate in his erroneous ideas. And so there was a conflict between the Egyptians and the Orientals on this account, and they remained thus for 20 years, disputing without coming to an agreement. And then finally, what can we learn from this very brief overview of the history of the church in the sixth century? And I've gone on much longer than I'd intended to. It is that the influence of the emperors had become very significant and could have an overwhelming effect on the life of the church from a human perspective. The church was not free to resolve its problems and the will of the emperor could be dominating. But even within the church, though there was a clear understanding about Christ, and most people held to an orthodox Christology, whatever language they used, the issue of Chalcedon remained an impossible obstacle to reconciliation. And even within the non-Chalcedonian movement, there was the experience of division and schism, mutual misunderstanding and misrepresentation, so that the end of the century was more disappointing than the beginning. Nevertheless, there were great examples of principle and faithfulness throughout this century. Many important figures, as well as the countless unknown monks and nuns, and even lay people, were willing to face every abuse rather than deny the faith they had received. There were also occasions when it seemed that unity might be possible, so that it's clear there were not two separated churches from the beginning. Rather, this was an outcome that was not necessary, but became inevitable as persecution removed the ranks of the non-Chalcedonian clergy. The century began with schism and ended in schism, but throughout it all, there are lessons to be learned and examples to be followed, mistakes to avoid and failures to resist. Church history is never black and white, but this confused reality is what teaches us most about ourselves. Uh, thank you. And again, I'm sorry I went on, um, but, um, what could I miss out? Um, God bless you.